of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, Hallelujah. you would lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. brings our chaos back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. All that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Hallelujah. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. Amen. Glory to God this morning. Thank you all for joining us uh, online and in the next room over and in this room. We just uh, trust that God's going to touch our lives this morning and, and that we'd all be transformed into the image of Christ as, as was intended by God. And uh, just a great, uh, great morning that we're under grace this morning. So let's keep singing about uh, grace. And just a reminder that if you have prayer requests this morning, there's an email you can send that into uh, on the screen. And also if you have a tithe or offering you feel led to give this morning, we encourage you in that as well. I rest my soul on Jesus when the mountains shake. I'll push my trust.
Ah. 
praise my worship, all of my worship, receive my worship, all of my worship. Yes, Lord, we thank you this morning. Just receive our worship. I just pray that this is pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord. I just pray it's all for your honor and glory. We thank you for your grace this morning. Thank you that we're saved by grace and not by works, um, that you paid the price on the cross for us, Jesus Christ. We just thank you for that. God, you're a good, good Father. You're such a good, good Father, Lord. We just thank you.
You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. There's no one like you, Lord. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Lord, we just thank you this morning. For being a good, good father. Being a good shepherd, Lord. We thank you that you called each of us to you. We just thank you that you won't leave us nor forsake us, Lord. Again, we thank you for your grace this morning that we didn't, uh, we didn't earn it, we don't deserve it, but still you pour it out. your goodness, your grace, God, that we can do any of this. We just worship you. We lift your name up this morning, God. Just praise you this morning. You're perfect, Lord. In the other room, I, maybe we can hear you, but just give a shout to a shout of praise to the Lord this morning. Amen. Glory to God this morning. Glory to God. Praise God this morning. We just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather as your family, as the, the body of Christ this morning. We thank you for, for each one here, God. We just pray for, uh, for Pastor Kevin as he brings forth your word this morning. We just uh, pray that uh, he would just deliver a word from you, God, inspired by you, uh, from your holy, holy word. We just thank you, Lord, for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Just my tie really quick now so I can see. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, great to see everybody. And I know it's uh, great to be seen and uh, to be heard. I was uh, thinking as we were worshiping there, the, I guess I'll call it the act of worship, there's something about shutting in with God. The Bible says shut in with God in a secret place. There's a secret place. And uh, I find that when I'm in any room, it doesn't matter. Once I shut in with God, I'm no longer with you. Like, I'm no longer in this room. And I bypass the location up here to ascend into another place, into another realm where I'm worshiping God uh, in my heart, not by location. 
And, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. Worship is a, is a wonderful uh, vehicle that we can travel to God's presence. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. And God can be here, but if you're not shut in with God, you miss, he's here, he's here. He's, he's at, uh, he's, he, in fact, he's, he's over at the school this morning. Uh, he's omnipresent, <laughs> he's everywhere. But where are you? And I can be driving my car, and I can be shut. Well, I don't close my eyes in the car, but the, the, uh, the, 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 the part about being shut in with God is everywhere. Everywhere you are, he is. But he's only revealed where you shut in with him. And uh, so even here this morning, as you shut yourself in with God, you feel God's presence because God is here. And uh, it's the great thing about our salvation because you can travel anywhere and still be in the presence of God if you're willing to shut in with him and be in that place with him. So a uh, little bit of a, uh, a word for you this morning that when you come here, uh, it's not the same as being somewhere else, but God hasn't changed because we changed locations. Was, well, now we've got to try to bring God here. No, God's everywhere you are. It's up to you to open up to God and to be in to be uh, in that realm of worship. Uh, I've been in worship before in different locations, in different places, in different churches across Canada and the United States. But anywhere I'm at that I shut in with God, I find God right there with me, no, no matter where it is, because uh, that's the kind of God that we serve. So you don't have to run to the church when you're having trouble. All you've got to do is shut in with God, and he's right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Risk an amen this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. There's no sense being with a bunch of people that are quiet. I might as well know you're here, right? Hallelujah. And I see it's not, Halloween's not over yet. You got your mask on. Hallelujah. So very good. I don't have any treats for you but the Word of God. And uh, I believe it's a life-changing word that God... Uh, I believe that words are, are always life-changing, but some are transforming. And, and there's a difference between... Uh, what you know about God and what you believe about God. We can all know uh, a whole lot. In fact, we study to know a whole lot more than some other people know, so that we know more. But what you know is not, shouldn't be compared with what you believe. God answers you according to what you believe, not according to what you know. These signs shall follow them that know everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Smile under that mask or something. I can't tell. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Matthew 12, verse 10. Let's stand together as we... And I'd like to also welcome all the people that are watching by via the internet. There's always more people online than even in our own church service when we were having church. There was always more people viewing the program than, than the 250 or so people, 220 to 250 people we had in our own audience. There was always more if you had looked at the program later there would be more people viewing it so god is good matthew chapter 12 verse 10 it says and behold there was a man who had a withered hand and they asked him saying is it lawful to heal on the sabbath that they might accuse him and he said to them what man is there among you who has one sheep and if it falls into a pit on the sabbath will not lay hold of it and lift it out or how much more valuable than uh, how much more value than is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? And he said to the man, "Stretch out your hand." And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him that they might destroy him. The church crowd went out plotted against him because he did something on a day that he shouldn't have done it. And the Pharisees thought it wasn't fair, you see. And there you have it. Father, today we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the atmosphere of worship. I thank you for the atmosphere of these people as we join together with God. That, Lord, that we can sense your very presence, your holy presence in this house today. And that, Lord, that we declare the word will be a lamp unto our feet. I thank you for the privilege that it is for me to share with people. And that, God, that you would give a word today in season that would transform lives. In Jesus' name, 
Amen, amen. Well, grab a seat and buckle up. We'll uh, get to the, the word. Tell your neighbor you're going to be transformed today. And then answer back, me too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I would like to say about the man with the withered hand that I haven't met anybody yet that doesn't have a withered area in their life. We, we all have our issues, our problems. There's somewhere that we don't come up to the full potential of everybody's thoughts and feelings towards. Does anybody here have a withered area in your life? Maybe some little small flaw. If you don't know of any, just ask your spouse or your friend or somebody beside you. I'm sure that they can point something out to you that will help you relate to the, to, to the word today. But when it comes to a withered area, usually for most of us, we want to keep that hidden. That's not putting your best foot forward. Uh, the, the man with the withered hand, I'm sure that uh, he wasn't waving his hand around that was withered. He would be concealing that. Uh, he didn't want people to think that he was any less than anybody. Have you ever met somebody that just doesn't want you to think that they're any less than anybody else, and yet they have issues? They have things in their, they have things in their life that, that, that hinder them from having full success, and uh, it's, it's, it is a problem, but, but uh, they, they somehow avoid it. And we all have friends. So today I wanted to talk about, you know, can you be a true friend, or can you stand to be a friend, or... Or are you even a true friend to yourself? Our greatest example of friendship, or our truest friend, is Jesus. And so, uh, would you all agree with me that Jesus is our best friend or our, our friend? And, it, and so, Jesus is also the pattern for which we should live life. Jesus said, follow me. So, he didn't say, uh, follow somebody you notice in the church, or follow some uh, uh, philosopher, or whatever. He said, follow me and I will make you. And so the, the real thing of discipleship or the real thing of, uh, of our, our withered areas in our life, if we're going to find an example to get rid of those or to get them healed, we must follow Jesus. Uh, the song that we, we sang, you know, we can have 10,000 and reasons and, and uh, we can't understand, but yet Jesus has the answer for us. Uh, it's, it's not so much the question you have. The question I have for you is, do you believe? Because Jesus has the answer, but oftentimes the answer, we won't accept the answer because we can't see it or we don't understand it. And, and we all have, uh, I would say, uh, good friends. We have friends that are just going to encourage you. Right? When you meet them, they're just going to build you up. You're going to feel really good about yourself when you meet those friends. And, and, and hopefully you're married to a good friend. But the, 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 the person uh, in uh, friendship, uh, they just only see good in you. Maybe like a, a mother with the child. You know, the child can't do anything wrong. This is the perfect. Next to Jesus, this is the most perfect specimen in the whole world. And they don't see anything wrong, or, or your grandchildren, you can just say, well, they're perfect and stuff. But uh, a true friend, a true friend, a biblical true friend or a Jesus true friend uh, does not only see good in you, because Jesus has sometimes pointed out something to me that I needed to change, and yet he's my true friend. Right? We just agreed that Jesus is your true friend. And so here's, here's somebody that you might think is a true friend and say, well, they just see good in me all the time. They just encourage me and build me up every time I talk to them. And they just love me. They think I'm everything. I was, I was getting gas the other day at the Irving, and this woman got out of her car and said, oh, oh my, is that really you? Yeah, that Matt, you know. And you're the man that writes for the paper. I said, yes, yes. Oh, she said, I don't even know how you can go out and be around the people. You're just, and I'm like, okay, this is getting weird. I'm getting my gas here. I'm going to leave. But I can't, I have to admit, driving a whale, I felt pretty important. I felt, here's somebody that, that's making me feel really important, right? And uh, uh, we can do that for people. We can, the Bible says to encourage one another unto good works. And so 
a, a, a true friend or, or a friend uh, should be putting value in your life because we all live according to value. We, we all need value to, to, to live for today or what's the use? So people that add value to you uh, are important people in your life. But also in this world, we have what we call uh, critics. Do you know any, don't look at anybody. Do you, do you know anybody that's critical of you, that, that only finds fault, that only sees evil, that only, not even evil, just, just looks at you from the bad point of view? You know, the, the, the compliment person would be the person that uh, you're sailing and uh, you're sailing in your sailboat and there's a big waterfalls. And everybody's screaming, the waterfalls, the waterfalls. But the, but the other person's saying, isn't he a good sailor? <laughs> isn't, look, my son, it's, it's like uh, he, he can do no wrong. And, and then, then the other side of it is, is that uh, you're trying your best, you're doing your best. In fact, you're very successful. You're a very successful person in your own world. You're very successful. You have a multi-million dollar yacht. You're out on the yacht uh, in the sun. Everything looks great. Everything seems good. And then you get a phone call from your critic. What, you're out in the sun? That sun will give you cancer. You're going to be dead by 25. And, and so they can't find anything good, no matter what good you're doing. And the other person can't find anything wrong, no matter what you're doing. And Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And Jesus doesn't mind pointing out your fault in spite of your feelings. Because Jesus is more interested in getting you to heaven than having your feelings bring you to hell. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. So we all love to be encouraged, and we all don't like to be criticized. I, I, I would ask for a show of hands, but I, I think I'm pretty sure on this item. Uh, in studying people's personalities, and it was always interesting, but I found out that, the, that, that there's two areas of life that... Uh, can, can cause us to be dysfunctional. I still believe that God can always heal us no matter what our history is. But our history can play right now into our today. And that is, if you were spoiled growing up, if you, were, you couldn't do no wrong, you were the perfect little child and stuff, what happens is, is that creates a person. That, that, that creates, and it can create a person that can't cope with correction. What, you're correcting me? I've never been corrected in my life. You must be wrong. And so somebody that's spoiled, what, you, what happens with a child that's brought up that's spoiled, they get to an age where uh, they feel they're perfect. They feel that, and, and they've, been, they've been convinced of that uh, their whole life. And so uh, uh, spoiling is not a true friend. Uh, spoiling is not is 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 not the right way to go in any relationship. Uh, the Bible says, "If you spoil, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child." And all that means is that if you spare correction with a child, if you spare uh, discipline, discipleship means disciplined ones. And so, so we should be open to correction from God. I believe there's some people that are so spoiled, even God can't correct them. Don't look at anybody, but I just wanted to mention that. And the trouble is, is once you're spoiled and you don't feel you can do anything wrong, uh, not only do you not understand correction, but you usually seek revenge against anybody that tries to correct you because it's lopsided. You're, and the, the other thing is, if you're not getting uh, the enough attention at home, uh, if you're not getting enough praise, if you're not getting enough, uh, you are, you know, all wonderful. Uh, it's those type of people you'll find on Charlotte Street at 11 o'clock at night looking for some praise and looking for, willing to pay some money to, to have somebody like them. And it, it all has to do with the, the fact that your value system is corrupted. Now, on a computer, if there's something corrupted, you're going to have to, you know, reload or, you know, do something to change it. And... And, and, and uh, if we're not willing to allow God to change us, uh, I believe you can, you can be spoiled, come into the church, and you have a really hard time growing up. You've been in the church a long, long time, and 
never grow up. In fact, the first time that the word corrects you, you may find yourself in another church. Well, it's all good when the word is working mightily in me, but it's not good when the word is correcting me. Yet the Bible itself says the word of God is profitable for, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness, for correction, that the man or the woman of God might be fully complete unto every good work. See, we need the balance in our lives. See, Jesus is this true friend, and, and, and Jesus had the ability, and Jesus was in the same place that we get in here. Jesus was in between two things here. The, the thing was, the man with the withered hand had the problem, and the Pharisees had the problem with what day of the week it was. So here's Jesus. Okay, if I please this guy, I'm going to disappoint these guys. If I please this guy, this guy with the withered hand is going to go through the, his whole life with a withered hand. I can make a difference, but am I willing to face conflict? Hello. I can see he's all thinking now. Even be, I can hardly see your face, but I can see that you're thinking. Uh, there is a difference between a friend... See, because I heard somebody tell me the other day uh, that they're going to be a friend and they're going to accept this other person just exactly where they are and leave them just where they are. They're, they're, they're quite happy with that. Uh, I tried to change them and I didn't work, so I've resolved that I'm not going to change them. I'm just going to leave them just as they are. So I did some thinking about that and I thought, wow. Would a true friend leave you when you had potential to do greater than what you're doing? See, Jesus looks at us, and yes, he accepts us right where we're at. But he no means leaves us right where we're at. Jesus is always into perfecting the saints to do the work of the ministry. He's always in perfecting us to be better examples of who he is. We follow him, and he teaches us, and he trains us how to be who we should be. We use the word Christian, but the word Christian, it doesn't make us better than anyone else, but it should make us balanced in the area of either uh, you know, being all over here where we're spoiled. And the other side is, is because we have both in society and both types of people you're going to meet, is a person that's been abused. So we have a person that's spoiled over here, and they have all of their own issues. And a spoiled person acts spoiled and privileged and whatever. But now abused person, I've met people before, and they did not have to tell me that they were abused. They were acting like an abused person. I've met people that are spoiled. And sometimes I didn't know. Have you ever opened your mouth and then you found you realized that your mouth shouldn't have been open? Have you ever, like, you, you know, okay, I shouldn't have said that to that person. See, Jesus is in the conflict here. Okay, if I say, stretch out your hand and be healed, uh, this man is going to be overjoyed to be healed. This crowd over here is going to hate me. So do I, do I obey my calling in spite of criticism or opposition. It said they plotted to kill him. This is pretty serious stuff for the church crowd to do, isn't it? Man, we don't only really like you that you don't go to our church. We're going to kill you for not going to our church. And, and the fact that you don't go on the day that we like you to go on, and we have all of these set rules, and you're willing to be a rule breaker. But see, something about your calling and something about your person, you have to decide, who am I following? Have I decided to follow the crowd? Have I decided to, to follow the status quo? Have I decided to, 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 to follow the political agenda of our day and who's voting for who? Or have I decided to follow Jesus and though none go with me, still I will follow? That, that, it, that come hell or high water, come, no matter what comes against me, no matter what opposes me, I have decided to follow Jesus. And so, so, so Jesus had to make a decision even in the face of criticism. And sometimes, watch this, sometimes we have to make decisions in spite of criticism. But, the, but the, now the abused person, I, ha, I was thinking of the abused person, and the, the, the abused person, so, so the, the spoiled person feels that they're all valuable. There's no one in the world like me. The abused person feels they're worth nothing. 
They're, they're, they have no value. And so I had this comparison this morning, was this here. This here is the spoiled person's bucket for compliments. And so when, when a compliment comes along, they can catch it real easy. Then they have, then they have for criticism, they have this. And should anybody criticize them, what? You can't criticize me. Here, give me a compliment. Tell me how good I am. Tell me how important I am. Tell me how wonderful I am. Well, you see, this person doesn't really work good in any relationship. If you bring this person, this spoiled person, oh, I'm so in love with this spoiled person. So you bring them into the relationship, and here they are. Oh, we've got to correct some stuff. Oh, no, we don't. I'm perfect. You married the perfect person. Well, 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 everybody's scared to shake their head, you know, like, not moving me a bit. I'm not moving. So anyway, that is the spoiled person coming into the marriage. So what about the abused person coming into the marriage? Well, now we've got to switch buckets. The abused person, I'm always hurt. I'm always put down. What are you saying bad about me now? What's wrong with me now? Go ahead, tell me, point out another fault. I'm always at fault. Oh dear, you're wonderful. I don't believe it. I can't receive it. And so abused person comes this way into a marriage, and the spoiled person comes this way <laughs> into the marriage, and now we have conflict. Now we better call the pastor and ask him for advice. He can solve it. He's the man of God. So I step in, and here's this person, and here's this person, and I'm saying to myself, God, unless you build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Because unless they surrender to God and allow God to adjust this whole area of their life, you see, the abused person is how they think on the inside of themselves. So the next person, I'd asked somebody the other day, uh, they were having this disagreement, and I said, if you go and go to them, just walk in the room where they're at, how do they see you coming? Do they see you coming as you're going to say something terrible about them, and you're going to criticize them, and be negative to them? Or do, or do they see you coming uh, as it's all about you, not about them? How do you see them coming? And do you see somebody that thinks they're your friend, not being your friend. I think some people got married to their friend who they thought they were the friend, but it was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Come on, somebody. We got it. Like the divorce rate can't be at 50% and say everything's fine, everything's wonderful. Always oh, the world good. Everything. Uh, there's real problems in our world. There's real situations. And here we have Jesus, in spite of conflict, speaking for truth. There needs to be a church. There needs to be a people that are going to speak the truth in love and tell people and say to people, listen, we need to grow up here a little bit. We need to be mature. We need to, we need to balance ourselves. So and the, one of the great questions I've asked myself in times of conflict, because I used to be in conflict with somebody, I'd say, God, fix them. There must be something wrong with them. <laughs> Jesus here is trying to do good. And surely in trying to do good, you wouldn't get in trouble with people. So here I am trying to do good. Surely I wouldn't get in trouble with people. Surely, you know, in, in, in the midst of... And all I want to do is, if somebody comes to me and says, this is the problem, they say, well, I'm thinking they're thinking that they need correction, so I might offer correction. But I found that correction inside of this person here who comes and is spoiled, if I say, well, now listen, this is what I think you've got to correct. They see correction as criticism, and criticism is always felt before destruction. So we say, can you take uh, positive correction? Well, that has to do with you, not, not with... See, Jesus, he, if, if, he, if he could only have sent the crowd away before he got the guy to stretch out his hand, it might have been better. Because Jesus, in spite of 
the circumstances. And see, that's the thing with Jesus. As you follow through the life of Jesus, you'll see him talking to some people and accepting some people that I might not like. Right? On the other hand, he rejected some people. I was thinking, Jesus, they could be your friends. They're going to crucify you. You better be smart here and just you know, back off a little bit. Right? But Jesus is a friend, a true friend, who has to be truly honest, has to be truly faithful, has to be the, <clears throat> the true healer, our true deliverer, our true re- rear guard, our, true, our mouthpiece, that life and death is in the power of the tongue, and if you can't control your tongue, you're going to speak death over situations, and Jesus is our example and says, man, stretch out your hand. We started off by saying everybody has issues, everybody has things, everybody has uh, uh, withered areas of their life. But if you conceal them your whole life, and I I don't want to be criticized, I don't want to reveal that area of my life, oh, the church crowd won't like me. Oh, this, this part of my family, they'll criticize me if I tell them I'm going to church now. They'll mock me. I remember when I got uh, saved and we came, came into the house, my mother said, you're not one of those born-again ones, are you? <laughs> and after that, for a whole year, she slammed the door in my face. Was I ready to be saved and criticized? I found the people that were my friends were no longer my friends, and the people that I didn't know were my friends became my friends because I came to Christ. And God puts the right people in your life if you're willing to grow. And we all come from one of two camps, either a camp that's spoiled or a camp that's abused. Because the world doesn't have any righteous people, no, not one. We've all been affected by the wages of sin. And the question is, is which camp did you come to the the camp of Christ with? And can you hear a compliment without putting it in the bucket of abuse? You're not helping me. What makes you think I want your money? Well, as I felt God tell me to, you know, to give you, what do you give me that for? You think I'm poor, do you? Trying to give you 20 bucks. What's going on here? (laughs) Felt God tell me. I didn't think I would get criticized following Jesus. Hello? You may be a candidate for criticism because you're following Jesus. And so, we have the two camps of people And we have Jesus as being the true friend, our true example. And he'll ask us, and he's asked me before, can I correct you? And the very fact he asked meant I wasn't willing to be corrected. But he's a faithful friend. Jesus wants to correct me, but he's not being critical of who I am. He said, this behavior is wrong, but you're not wrong. And, and I've said to some couples who had had this, 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 these issues coming together, I would say, well, you're going to have to come up with, and I called it a, a compliment account for each other, that you could build yourselves up. I said, instead of the next withdrawal on your relationship, you declare bankruptcy. What do you have in your account that balances your relationship with people? And, and if you don't have the right amount, the wrong thing will destroy you. I wonder how some people can, can, can seemingly seem on the outside that I can find no fault in them. And I remember judging God based on people. I would see people, I'd know people, and I'd say, God... Then something happens. I say, God, I don't understand that. What I know about them, this shouldn't have happened. And God said it happened because of what you don't know. I think that God knows a little more than we do. But oftentimes we judge according to what we know, according to our own understanding. We lean on, we lean on our own understanding instead of acknowledging that God knows more than we do. And when we do that, we get ourselves in trouble and yet Jesus is our example, and uh, when well, I was thinking of marriage, marriage is meant to be the best of friends, the, the, the people that can, can get along, and sometimes that doesn't happen. 
Because every relationship, watch this, here in this church, every relationship you choose to have with people will require correction. So when you're going out looking for the perfect church, please drive by the the church here because we're just people who want to serve God to the best of our ability And when the sick and the lame come, we want to see them healed on whatever day of the week it is. And oftentimes, our past religion is the problem that God's trying to get over to give us present help in the time of trouble. We should be rejoicing that the withered hand is healed instead of plotting against Jesus because he did something that we don't like. And who is he to correct us? Inside of each one of us is both negative and positive voices. Inside of us, there's a cheering section that cheers us on, and there's also a booing section that says, bad, bad, you've been bad, you've been bad. And in, in, in life, uh, there's a difference between me just accepting and then me just leaving you alone. Just, oh, whatever you do is good enough. Oh, I see a lot more potential in you, but I, but, but I dare not say it because I might lose you as a friend. Because if I correct you, and you're in either camp here, if you come into the church and you're really spoiled, and you come in, you're spoiled, you got your big spoiled bucket, or you come in, you're really abused, and I come along and correct you, you find somewhere else to be. Jesus' disciples, Jesus spoke, and he said, eat my body and drink my blood. John 6, verse 66, says, when Jesus said that, many left him. See, 666 will always make you leave. And Jesus said to his disciples, will you leave me too? And they said, where else would we go? Who else has the words of life but you? And so sometimes it's in spite of correction that we say uh, we need to be fixed. We need to be changed. You see, my, my, my agenda, God's agenda to me, was to mature the church. We said mature people. That's, that's what I felt my call was, to mature people. But it wasn't to, to mature people just to have mature people. It was to mature people that would be an example to the world that if you, wanna, you, want some, you want some maturity in your life, come to a place where there's mature people and associate with mature people such as you are that, that they could learn by example how to be mature. Amen. So I thank God for mature people. Who, and How do we know you're mature or not? Well, we only know the next time you're corrected. Come on. Hallelujah. Some people avoid marriage. I don't want to be corrected. Some people leave marriage. Why? I'm out of here. Last time you're telling me what to do, I'll leave my shorts on the floor if I want to. I'll leave the toothpaste out on the counter if I want to. Not telling me what to do. Every little bit of correction, it doesn't matter what it is, the smallest thing gets vengeance on the heart of somebody that's either spoiled or abused. And yet God wants to said, stretch out your witheredness. Take that area, stretch it out and say, God, I'm not as mature as I should. God, I just stretch it out to you. God, help me if I'm a person that can't take correction. Lord, I stretch it out and help me to take... God, if I see everything as abusive, God, help me to accept a compliment. God, help, help me. Let me stretch that out to you. The, the devil has wounded me as a child. I was abused as a child. I was hurt. And, 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 and yeah, my, my bucket of abuse is so big. I just hear everybody's abusing me. Everybody's abusing me. Nobody likes me. But God, let me stretch that out to you. Let me give that to you. And, and as soon as you do, I want to say this to you. As soon as you do, somebody's going to criticize you for it. Why? Because people haven't changed in 2,000 years. As soon as you look like you're getting better, somebody else is wishing you were worse. What are you doing going to that church? What are you doing doing this for? 
You buy yourself a new car and somebody's saying you're selling drugs on the side. How could you afford that? Everybody's critic. Everybody's a critic. But as for me and my house, I have decided that I will serve the Lord. Let my yea be yea and my nay be nay. In other words, let me be honest with the, with the, with the words that I have to say. And Jesus, as our example, said, I could let these people all go to hell. Or I could have a conflict with the devil. And I could face a cross. And I could face some abuse. And I could be spit upon. And I could, wear, I, could, I could wear a crown of thorns. And they could mock me and tease me. But there is a people, oh, for the joy that is set before me. I see a people just on the other side of this cross. And I will endure the cross for the joy that is set before me. That I might have the people that I want. And today we are celebrating as the people of God that Jesus went to the He took the criticism of the cross and turned it into a wonderful gift of salvation. He's a wonderful Savior. He's a wonderful God. Worldly friends will come and go. And you'll never know they were there because they never helped you a bit. I would rather be a friend that after you leave and you say, he told me about Jesus. I don't know what he meant, but he told me about Jesus. I remember hitchhiking when I was a kid. And I got in this car and it was a an Anglican minister. Of course, being 12 or 13 years old, I was where, well, I was probably not where average kids are because of where I grew up. But I remember him saying to me, are you a Christian? And I said, no, sir, I'm not. Oh, okay. And then getting out of the car, he said, nice to meet you, young man. Remember Jesus. Is it? Remember Jesus. For months after that, I couldn't get that out of my head. Remember Jesus. The author. He didn't, he, he didn't say the rest. I only know him now because I know him now. But he said, remember Jesus. To all your friends, Remember Jesus, because Jesus makes the difference. When you stand for truth, it means that you will have conflict. I can't change that. Noah stood for something. He said, I'm going to build an ark. People mocked him and said, it's not even raining out. What are you doing? Moses stood for something. He said, I'll deliver the people of God. Let my people go. Pharaoh said, I'll kill you. I'll hunt you down with my army and kill you. Joseph stood for something. He said, I have a dream. His brothers put him in a pit and sold him as a slave. All your acts of righteousness and kindness, you think, I'll never get criticized for this. Oh, the church crowd, they'll all love me if I do this. David stood for something when he saw Goliath. He said, who is this Philistine dog? His brothers mocked him and said, what are you, why aren't you home looking after those few sheep that you're, of your father? God stood for something when he sent his only begotten son. Though criticized and mocked by this world, though you think that out in this world, Jesus never came the pollution, the, the evil. God so loved the world. And I thought about that and I thought, well, God, you loved a world that's rejecting you. God said, yes, but look inside the church. I died for everybody. Some reject me for this reason. Some reject me for that reason, but I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Father, I thank you today, Lord, for everyone here, that Lord, that in that withered area of our life, in that area of our life where we need to give it to you. Because God, we come from either camp. We can, I can talk about how I was abused. Somebody else could talk about how they were spoiled. 
But all in all, God, with all of our personality and all of our faults and all of our feelings, like God, we got to, like that man with the withered hand, knowing that the crowd wouldn't be happy with him if he stretched it out. But I asked you today, and I asked those that are watching via the internet, would you stretch out your problem to God? Would you, would you, would you dare to, to say, I want to believe? I want to believe that Jesus can heal this withered hand of mine, that Jesus can heal this withered heart of mine, that Jesus can heal this, this, this broken situation of mine. God, I stretch it forth to you, and I do believe. You can say under your breath today, I do believe. I do believe. I am a believer, and I will stand for something. And having done all, I will stand. I thank you, Lord, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Be again with us next week.
my word.